Welcome to Sobriety Checkpoint. Are you a parent in recovery, wishing for peace and emotional sobriety? Do you find yourself up late at night, Googling things like how to overcome negative thinking or why is my heart racing? Do you wake up with big, ambitious goals only to feel resentful and irritable when you put everyone else's needs first and leave no time for yourself again? Hey, I'm Felicia. I'm a 12-step returned therapist, and I too have battled anxiety and that critical inner voice. All I wanted was peace and just a little bit of time to myself. I tried to strive and achieve to find happiness, but that only left me with more anxiety. I finally realized I needed to discover my true identity to find the peace I was striving to attain. In this podcast, you're going to find solutions to navigating mental health, spirituality, and relationships to experience the peace you've been craving. It's time for that desperately sought-after solo target run. Grab your keys and let's go for a drive. There's no judgment or breathalyzer at this sobriety checkpoint. Tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do, and then we'll get into, I guess, the attachment theory questions. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. So my name is Thais. Um, Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. And um, essentially what I do is I actually ran a client-based practice for about eight years or so, eight and a half years maybe, and um, did a lot of work first on the subconscious mind. So sort of went the traditional route for school and then partway through was like, you know what, I'm really interested in a lot more to do with the subconscious mind. So did a whole bunch of like post schooling certifications, especially in like hypnosis, um, NLP, these sorts of things. And I didn't like the idea of hypnotizing people, but I like the idea of recognizing that our conscious mind and subconscious mind work very differently. So one of the things that stood out to me is I was having a conversation one day with somebody in a psychology class and they said, your conscious mind can't outwill or overpower your subconscious mind. And for me, that was like, oh my goodness. So you're telling me that like, we can consciously intend to do all these things, but like your subconscious mind and its programs are going to be the things that make the biggest game changing difference. So what I ended up doing is being really obsessed with going down that path and eventually went into a space where I wanted to understand how to help people like recondition their own subconscious mind from their own pain points, challenges. And over time, what I found is (laughs) the vast majority of those pain points and challenges came from, of course, our attachment traumas in childhood and, and a lot to do with how we attach, what we learned about relationships, what we learned about the relationship to ourselves because of the different experiences we had in our household and what we sort of made that mean about us. And so I originally worked a lot to do with like reconditioning these subconscious patterns and limiting beliefs and working on needs and boundaries. And then it really went into realizing that a lot of these patterns that were emerging actually fit really neatly into the different attachment styles. Um, So then did a lot of work with with clients in that space um, and eventually just had a really long wait list of like a couple of years and people were constantly getting frustrated with me. So I was like, you know, because people were going how long, you know, and, and following up and, you know, sometimes clients weren't leaving my practice and and things like that. So eventually I was like, I'm going to just put this information more online. And um, and that sort of started the whole journey. So I do a lot of daily content on YouTube and then also a lot of um, work with the personal development school. So we do like all these different courses and um, daily support groups and webinars and all sorts of things in there. Well, can you go ahead and you can share uh, your information about how to find you on YouTube? Yeah. So, so, um, it's personal development school dash Thais Gibson. And that's, uh, where we usually put about daily content on there. Um, so I have been doing daily content for the last like few years and, um, yeah, there's like, <laughs> I think there's like 1600 videos on there. So. Awesome. I wrote down what you said. You can't outwill or your, your conscious mind cannot outwill your subconscious mind. I love that. I absolutely love that because a lot of times that's what we're trying to do, even in therapy, even in the realm of addiction every day, right? Like, Um, yes. Like, and, and I know that that, you know, we're going to talk about attachment cells, but I just, I can't like, you know, I actually really struggled, um, as an addict for, from about 15 years old till 20, 21 years old. And this is actually a big part of what, like I was very high functioning, but I had a knee surgery, really struggled with opiates. 
And this was actually what kind of woke me up to this stuff is that I was going all the time. I was going like, I'm going to delete these people's phone numbers. I'm going to avoid these people that I, you know, would run into. I'm going to try. And you, you make this plan of all the things you're going to do because your conscious mind knows better. Your conscious mind knows how terrible this is and how it's letting down your family and your loved ones and all these different things. But your subconscious mind is running the show and it's actually making up 95 to 97% of your decisions throughout the day, your emotions, your belief patterns, your thought patterns, they come from there. And so anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I got really excited for a minute. (laughs) Oh, I cannot believe how excited I am about this conversation today after getting that going. I almost feel like a a heretic right now with what I'm about to say. (laughs) Like this is, this is my issue with things like CBT. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, it, cause it's, it's, and, and at the same time, I think it could be a good thing. It can be a good thing. I'm not completely bashing it, but I think there's just so much more. Like, I feel like that's really great service level work and being able to focus on, on learning about kind of like those inner parts that we have. I'm really into, um, internal family systems informed therapist, and I absolutely love it. I love you know, getting to know our parts, our, you know, inner child, inner critic, all of these different parts that are at play all the time, 24 seven inside. Do you know about IFS? Yes. yes, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's like, it's about getting to know what's going on in my subconscious and it's amazing. So as far as attachment goes, I guess, you know, if you could talk about, I guess, what attachment theory is. Yes, for sure. So, so, um, traditional attachment theory was developed by John Bowlby and, and then he paired up with Mary Ainsworth. Um, it's been studied for a very, very long time, but essentially what they started off with was something called the strange situation experiment. So they had, um, a child and their primary caregiver come into, it was sort of like a doctor's office type of setting, like a, with a waiting room. And they would have the caregiver leave the child alone in the waiting room for two minutes and, and come back. And, see how the child responded. And that actually helped them deter- to determine what attachment style that child was. So our original attachment style, according to traditional attachment theory, develops between the ages of zero to two. And you would see a number of different responses. A securely attached child, when when the parent returned, would you know, be happy the parent was there, but would be fairly comfortable in the waiting room when the, the parent left. The anxious attached child would end up being very distressed when the parent was gone, feel calm when the parent was back. Then we have our disorganized attachment style who would feel very chaotic when the parent was gone and still remain chaotic when the parent was back. And then our dismissive avoidant attachment style is the attachment style who would feel very, you know, subdued and sort of go inward when the ch- when the parent was gone. And they would actually refuse to look at the parent when the parent came back. Um, and so you could sort of determine through this experiment, and there's a, a whole bunch of other research that's very much simplifying it, but um, essentially what happens is we learn that we have these attachment styles. I like to think of our attachment style as like the subconscious set of rules that we learn about love. So for example, like if you and I are a different attachment style, it's really not that much different than, you know, trying to build a friendship, for example, and we sit down and you know, if you use the analogy of a board game, like we try to play a board game together and you have the rules for Monopoly and I have the rules for Scrabble. Like it's just not going to go well because we have different rules for what it's supposed to look like, be like, feel like everything. And so, you know, what ends up happening is when we have different attachment styles, it really affects our adult romantic relationships. And what also happens is we take these um, caregiver relationships with our parents and we actually replace as our primary attachment figure our parent with our romantic partner as adults. And so whatever's unresolved there, whatever subconscious beliefs we're carrying, whatever different pain points, unmet needs we have, um, that will essentially spill all into our adult romantic relationships. And a lot of people will be like, oh, sure, you know, it, I don't really notice that. But it's it's specifically once you make an attachment to somebody. So sure, you can be great with dating for the first few weeks and taking it easy, but it's once you really form that attachment bond with somebody, whatever's unresolved from childhood will eventually be carried into your relationship in a number of different potential forms. So that's sort of a, a small summary of attachment theory. And then the different attachment styles, I'll just say really briefly. So we have the securely attached style who statistically does the best in romantic relationships, tends to have the the longest lasting relationships, most harmonious relationships. And then we have our three insecure. So those ones I was mentioning. So you've got your anxious, you've got your dismissive, and then you've got your disorganized or fearful avoidant attachment style, commonly referred to as either. Our anxious 
terrified of abandonment, constantly feels activated in relationships, worrying about maintaining proximity, triggered if somebody takes space or doesn't call back or there's a shift in the pattern, dismissive avoidant, tends to fear commitment in relationships, doesn't want to be enmeshed, engulfed, tries to keep people at arm's length and avoids vulnerability. And then our fearful avoidant essentially doesn't form a healthy attachment strategy in childhood because there's a lot of chaos and unpredictability. So as a result of that, they internalize that unpredictability. They constantly walk on eggshells and they end up being very hot and cold in relationships. They're kind of all over the map. One day they really want to be with you. Then you get close. They're like, get away from me, stay back. And they can really have that pendulum swinging from one direction to the other. So I have a feeling that my listeners might be figuring out what their attachment style is by giving that brief summary. And one of the things that I think is interesting about attachment styles, you know, especially when I first heard about it, was it almost seems like, oh my gosh, I'm doomed, right? Like, oh, okay, I this is my attachment style, I'm doomed. And what I've learned is, I mean, you can make a shift, right? So, so this is the part that I'm really hoping um, that, you know, that I wanted you to speak to is the fact that there's, there's hope in moving towards becoming more secure. And I mean, the, the question, how is a huge question, but that's what I'm going to ask you. You know what, how can somebody start? I guess maybe that's, that's maybe a little bit better of a question. What, what are, what are the starting points? How do you even begin to go into this world of making this shift towards becoming more secure over time? Yeah, great question. And really important question. So so um, we actually created, because of this, we created something called integrated attachment theory, which the whole point of this is designed to help people um, become securely attached through targeting six major areas. So I started working, as I sort of mentioned before, with clients on like their limiting beliefs, their unmet needs. We have to remember, first and foremost, nobody's born with an attachment style. It's developed. So it's developed through conditioning, right? Meaning that if something can get conditioned into us, it can get reconditioned, right? Uh, Applying those same sorts of principles. So I found that there's six things that we have to do in order to become securely attached. Number one, we have to recondition our subconscious beliefs that are not serving us. So sometimes people will carry these beliefs because of their experiences in childhood. Things like, oh, love will make me feel trapped or helpless or powerless. Or if I'm vulnerable, then I am weak. Or I can't trust anybody. Or I'll always be abandoned. Or I'm terrified of being alone. So we have these different limiting beliefs that we get conditioned with in childhood because of the experiences we have or experiences that are modeled to us about love. And we have to learn to recondition. We can talk about the how after. So number one, reconditioning your limiting beliefs at the subconscious level of mind. Number two, we have to learn what our greatest unmet needs are from childhood around love and learn to actively meet those needs in the relationship to ourselves. And then number three, communicate those needs to others. Okay. And that's how we're actually healing childhood wounds in the process, right? Because these deep things we couldn't access as children, if we can give those to ourselves as adults and then learn to healthily request them from others, it's very healing. So we've got um, number one, recondition your limiting beliefs. Number two, meet needs. Number three, communicate needs, learn healthy communication with others. Number four, emotionally regulate. A lot of this has to do with nervous system regulation work. Because for example, if we take a child who let's say is fearful avoidant um, or disorganized, they often grow up in a lot of um, chaos. So they'll often be in sort of this like fight or flight state for prolonged periods of time when we can do very simple nervous system regulation activities on a daily basis and get more into parasympathetic and get more grounded, embodied in our body through doing that, we see massive results. And then the last two after that are really just relearning how to have boundaries. A lot of attachment styles have a bit of a dysfunctional relationship to boundaries and then learning. And it's sort of like a bonus one just to recondition old behaviors like these coping mechanisms we have. They often come from us not having better coping mechanisms as children and not having better access to things. Um, So when we really learn how to do these things at the subconscious level, then we can actually see the needle move, like recondition these old coping behaviors. So those are the six major things. It sounds like a lot, but it's actually quite simple. Like once you really work through different limiting belief patterns and, and learn how your subconscious works and learn to meet your needs and communicate, that naturally spills into your boundaries, your behaviors. And then there's just a little bit of nervous system work to do. I mean, number five again, I'm taking notes just so you know. (laughs) So so it goes, um, recondition your limiting beliefs, number one, 
especially about love and relationships. Number two, meet your needs. Number three, communicate needs. Number four, um, emotional regulation. So nervous system regulation work. Then number five, we have actually working through our boundaries. And then number six, we have working through our, our limiting behaviors. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if, if you are listening and you already don't have a piece of paper and a pen, I really suggest you grab that. You know, you rewind this a couple of minutes back, listen to this again and take those notes because I wrote all those down. I love this. This is great. So you mentioned getting a little bit more into, into the how, right? You, you said that this is, this does seem like a lot. I mean, to me, I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, yeah, this is, this is awesome. This makes sense. I mean, I guess if you could talk about, you know, what does this look like for, for someone to kind of go through, go through these steps, you know, which, what, what, what can they do to, to get through these six steps? Yes. So I know it sounds like a lot. <laughs> um, I will say like with the programs we put people in. So we have these, these programs with a lot of follow-up support, but um, usually people are becoming predominantly secure. Um, so over 50% secure as a baseline, um, 92% of participants within 90 days. So we're seeing like, you know, it sounds scary if you're listening, oh my gosh, six things, but like really it's sort of like a checklist of six things. So the first thing is that we have to recognize how the subconscious mind works. So the subconscious mind, first and foremost, does not speak language. It speaks emotion and imagery. And I'll give you a really good example. If I say to you, whatever you do, do not think, if you care about this podcast, do not think of the pink elephant. Like you can't help it. Like your brain just thought of the, of the pink elephant. Your your subconscious didn't hear do not, and yet your subconscious visualized the pink elephant. And that happens to everybody, right? And so what we have to realize is when you were talking about CBT earlier, like CBT can be really powerful if we learn to anchor it into our subconscious, but without the subconscious work, it's extremely limiting, right? Because you can say all these things, you can challenge these, these sort of thought patterns, but unless you're actually reconditioning and rewiring these things, then it can it can only sometimes go so far. So one of the first parts is that the subconscious speaks emotion and imagery and it doesn't speak through like the typical language we think of also meaning that like affirmations can be quite limiting, right? Because you can say, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. But your subconscious isn't grasping onto that. And all of these patterns exist subconsciously. So there's, there's lots of tools for reprogramming the subconscious mind. I'll just give one. Um, there's about 20 different ones that, that are out there and available. This is the one that we use quite frequently. So it's called auto-suggestion. It's essentially like combining belief reprogramming with auto-suggestion. And how auto-suggestion works is we leverage how the subconscious ever got programmed to begin with, okay? So let's say you have a child, they grow up in a home, and they're exposed to repeated experiences. Maybe the caregiver constantly makes them feel abandoned and is constantly pulling away. Well, what that's doing is it's accidentally leveraging emotion because the child feels abandoned from their caregiver and repetition, which is what fires and wires neural pathways. So what we have to do is we have to take this limiting belief. So let's just use the example of um, I am abandoned or I'm not good enough as, as the anxious preoccupied. So the anxious attachment style. Let's say we'll just use I'm not good enough. What we have to do is we can't say I'm good enough, I'm good enough, I'm good enough because that's just language. We have to find evidence for why we are good enough. So if you, for example, were to say, I went to the school, I graduated to, with this degree, the more you can get specific and, and think of specific memories for where you felt good enough, memories, all memories contain emotion. So if you get somebody to close their eyes and tell you their favorite childhood memory, they'll smile. They'll, their body language will change. If somebody tells you their least favorite childhood memory, they'll close off. You'll see it. Like we, we carry emotion in our memory. So when we're trying to reprogram, we have to find the opposite of this original belief. I'm not good enough to I am good enough or I'm abandoned to I am connected. And then we have to find 10 to 15, so we get the repetition, pieces of evidence or memory, because then we're leveraging repetition plus emotion. We're now speaking to the subconscious mind. And we have to do this over 21 days. And this is this has tremendous results for people. So if, if you sit down and you come up with 10 to 15 pieces of proof for why you are good enough today or why you're good enough in general, you're allowed to repeat some of them across the 21 days and you can really feel about it, you're getting out of your conscious mind and you're actually using your conscious logical mind to feed information to your subconscious mind, which is where this limiting belief actually exists in the first place. And as we do this, we actually shift this mechanism in our brain called the reticular activating system 
that will actually start filtering information to also see more and more how we are good enough and we'll really build that momentum. And so there's many other tools, but that's one really simple one. 10 to 15 pieces of evidence oppose this painful limiting belief across 21 days. We can even do two at a time. And this first tool helps us to really recondition um, our limiting beliefs at a subconscious level. I actually really like the fact that you addressed what I said about CBT because you just like made a connection that I was like, oh, that's what I'm missing. And I think I think I haven't historically liked it because I haven't figured out how to use it in a deeper way than than just on the surface. So when whenever I am looking at it, you know, reading about it, learning about it, it has remained on the surface for me. So I haven't been able to leverage this approach by connecting it in the way that you just said. So I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And it's funny that you spoke to that because I'm over here and I've got this this part of me that's saying, nope, what I said about CBT, I'm going to have my editor take that out. But now, <laughs> but now, but, but but it's now I'm not going to. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear that. Oh my gosh. Come back next week to hear Thais break down these steps in further detail. I'm looking forward to having you back. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Before you go, please subscribe and leave a five-star written review. Reviews help boost my ratings, which helps other parents in recovery find my show. If you're interested in emotional sobriety coaching, please reach out and schedule a call. Check out the show notes for my contact info and social links. Don't forget to like, follow, and share with a friend. I'm super excited to know this podcast is helping you. Tune in Thursdays for the latest episode. I'll see you back here on your next target run. Until next time. This podcast is produced by Bob Sloan Audio Productions.